All right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was last of end. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my name is Rodrigo Nogueira, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, three things: success, limitations, and future applications on neuro hammers. And you understand a bit what is hammer in this context. It's uh, our uh, preferred uh, transformer model. And um, yeah. So the first part, I'll talk uh, what I think uh, many of you, many of the previous uh, talks already hinted. At. So zero shot finally works. So this is a more positive mood of the talk. And then in the second part, uh, we'll talk about some limitations of this transformer architecture. Uh, I will show an example in which it cannot do simple addition, like you give it a model two numbers to, to edit it, and it cannot do it well. Um, and I'll give some evidence that this the problem might be in the positional encoding of the transformer architecture and some ways maybe to fix it. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll go back again to the more positive mood in which I'll, I'll show, I think, a, a nice application of how to use these models to help us on, the, on elaborating hypotheses, generating uh, to see what's going on on large amounts of text, and then uh, how to predict how, what it will be the evolution of scientific corpora. Yeah. So in the first part, yeah, zero shot finally works. And uh, we're quite fond of this pipeline uh, that we applied on many competitions. And it's called the Expando Mono Dual. And it, it works as follows. Uh, we have Dr. Query, which is this model that ten, uh, tries to predict what kind of questions a document might answer. And then we have a corpus. We feed the corpus into Dr. Query. It will predict uh, many queries for each one of the documents in the query, in the, in the corpus. And then we append those questions to the document, to the document text, and this will form, you give us our expanded corpus. And then once we have this expanded corpus, you can use BM25 to provide us an initial set of candidate documents for a given query. And then we use this re-ranker called Mono T5, which is a T5 model, a large one. Uh, you can have many flavors like this in particular case, will show many results on the three billion parameter model. So it's quite expensive but it works uh, really well in zero shot setting. And what T5, Mono T5 does is quite simple, takes as a query as input together with a candidate document and tries to estimate the relevance uh, for uh, the document being relevant to the query. Once we get those scores, we simply re-rank uh, those documents, those candidate documents according to those scores and feed it into a second stage re-ranker called dual T5. This T5 model is also a T5 model that takes as input now a pair of documents and tries to estimate each one of them is more relevant to the query. And then somehow we aggregate those scores and then show the final uh, list of uh, documents to the user. So this is our expanded mono dual pipeline. And one thing that uh, all the models they have in common, they are trained on MS Marco and evaluated on other data sets. So we don't apply any fine tuning to these models at all to, to, the, uh, to the target task, um, only rely on MS Marco data. And uh, we call these models hammers because we don't modify our, our architecture. The hammer is the only two that we get and we see everything as a nail. And uh, that's how we apply these models. And um, yeah, if you look at Robust 04, I, Andrew already hinted, um, uh, this, this is a popular uh, IR benchmark. And uh, by simply using uh, Mono T5, the 3 billion version, uh, this is a zero shot train on MS Marco. We do pretty well, like uh, we can be uh, as good as uh, Parade model. Of course, Parade is much smaller, but also uh, it needs some, uh, it was trained on uh, a little bit on, on robust data. And in this case, Mono T5 is a simple uh, zero shot. But yeah, and uh, it has this, this advantage is a large model, but nevertheless, it works quite well on the zero shot setting. Um, we also participate in the Trek COVID competition. It was run from April to September 2020. And the task here was to find scientific articles relevant to questions like this one. And uh, we participate in the five rounds. We are either the top or second sub, uh, in the leaderboard, competing against many uh, strong teams like Google, University of Glasgow. And uh, we only use this expander mono dual pipeline uh, without uh, any modification to the task at hand. So it works uh, well in this zero shot setting. We also participate in the track 2020, the precision medicine track. The task here is again to find scientific articles in PubMed uh, to answer, uh, to find what kind of treatments are effective to some types of disease with some types of gene mutations. Uh, so it's quite complex questions. Uh, we, we got the second place in this competition. Uh, we only lost for Alibaba uh, for a small amount of points. And this model 
is also an ensemble of BERT based models, but that were uh, fine tuned. Um, actually, it was adapted a little bit to the task at hand, whereas our model is only fine tuned MS Marco again. So it works well as well in, the, in this uh, precision medicine task. Um, then there is health misinformation, track 2020 again. Uh, one interesting thing about this, uh, this track is that it penalizes when the document and when the model return documents that are contain incorrect information. In other words, it, it returns fake news. So we have uh, the metric for this competition is it's made of uh, two main met two sub metrics. Uh, the first one in the y axis is uh, the amount of mm, uh, harmful documents that were presented to the user. And the x axis is the uh, number of relevant documents that are presented. So uh, the further down to the right, the better the results. If we just use our uh, our pipeline BM25 with Mono T5, we, we already better than the competition. But then if we add this label T5, which tries to predict um, if the evidence provided is weak or strong, this was trained on only 4,000 examples from the previous year's track, we, we do much better in terms of uh, not providing harmful documents to the user. So this, again, it's our hammer T5, Mono T5, it's to, to just rank documents. Label T5 is to decide if we're going to show to the users or not. And finally, we have this uh, Coley 2021, the legal case entailment task. And the task here is to identify supporting evidence uh, for a given legal case. So this is in the legal domain. Uh, the input is a, is a passage, uh, like a query, uh, a long, like a long query. And uh, we just try to estimate how relevant those candidates are to, to, be, to serve as a supporting evidence to a legal case. So again, Mono T5 was trained on MS Marco, and we got the first place in this competition, well above the second place, second best team. And um, one interesting thing here is that if we fine tune on the task, we actually get a worse performance on this held out test set, meaning that we did some overfitting during our evaluation, um, it, or at least uh, the training data that they provided, uh, it was different from the test data. It was, in other words, it was from different distribution, but nevertheless, uh, simply applying the zero shot without no modification put us in the first place. Um, but this is this is all great, like these models, they work uh, quite well, but as uh, I, I cannot remember, couldn't find who said this, but uh, that supervised learning is the heroine of the machine learning researcher. Like we, we are addicted to the to this training labels. And they, they give us the impression that we're doing really well on the task at hand. But then as soon as we switch the task a little bit, it might, the model might break quite a lot. And uh, I think computer vision community already saw that with ImageNet. And here I show a uh, quite nice figure uh, drawn from the clip paper from OpenAI. Uh, here they show that uh, in blue, that the models train on ImageNet. And the y-axis is the performance in the ImageNet. And the, sorry, the x-axis is the performance in ImageNet. Y axis in performance on, on out of the main uh, uh, distribution, and the in the in the purple one is the model trained on um, a clip model trained on the a more naturally occurring data, uh, meaning um, images with uh, the, their respective captions. Uh, this is a much larger data set, but it's naturally occurring, so we don't need uh, human uh, labeling effort. And we saw that it has a much better zero shot uh, performance than the ones trained on ImageNet. So uh, with that, I, I, I argue that the next revolution information retrieval will be fully unsupervised, or at least we're going to need a very few amount of training examples just to give a hint to the model what to expect from its output. But uh, we won't need, like, uh, like Niels Heimer's already pointed out, we, we shouldn't need half a million training examples uh, to learn the relevance task well, like we, we should resort. We as a human, we don't need that amount of training data, so I think our model shouldn't in order to perform well on these zero shot tasks. Yeah, this, this was part one, uh, very positive mood. Now in part two, I, I'll give some more a negative uh, uh, feeling about uh, the, how these transformer architectures they work and expose at least one limitation that we found. Uh, and that is the task here is quite simple. Like we just asked the train the model to add two numbers. So what is 701 plus this other one? Uh, we give it to our hammer, T5, and uh, train it to produce the answer token by token or character by digit by digit. And 
we of course we have an infinite amount of training data for this task but we are looking at the specific the load training data regime how these models they can uh, quickly uh, learn the task and uh, so we took a t5 base model training with 1000 examples uh, on this task and um, in the in this red curve um, we just feed it to the model the model the target output of the model will be its uh, subword representation I, in other words no no special treatment for numbers uh, it's just the way the model was pre-trained we just fine tune it uh, that's what we call here decimal representation and uh, as you can see the model cannot learn how to sum up uh, five digits uh, it, it completely fails um if we apply this trick of just uh, separating the digits uh, putting a space in between we get we have this character level representation the, uh, which is shown the orange curve the model performs better now but it still fails uh, around 10 digits uh, during this this addition task then in the red curve we see that it performs much better and what we did here we introduced this intermediate positional uh, explicit positional tokens 10 to the uh, 10 e1 10 e0 so the model knows uh, the digits to the left or to the right what position uh, in the in the number it occupies so what's its, its significance uh, for that particular number. And then the model uh, performs much better with only these thousand uh, training examples. It can do more or less addition of up to 30 digits. Uh, this is great, but then the model was trained with 30 digits and evaluated on 30 digits. What happens with a train on 30 and test on 60? And then accuracy of all the models that we tried, even the three billion parameter ones uh, were, were barely above zero. So these, we can consider these, these models, they, it, it it could not learn the simple addition task. Uh, this also is not a problem of training examples. If we give them 10 million training examples, it, it can also not learn uh, the simple carryover operations. So there seems something uh, wrong here. If you look at the output of the model, uh, it seems to try to shorten the sequence. Uh, so it generate correctly until up to, the, to this point, and then it suddenly uh, loses 10 digits during its, its generation process. And uh, we're not sure what, what's going on here exactly. And um, one interesting work, I think that hints uh, uh, what, what might be a, 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 a good fix to this type of problem is that uh, uh, we need some fixed positional encodings. This is the Alibi model from, from Ophir Press uh, recently introduced. And he argued, they argue that uh, we don't need to learn the positional embeddings of the model in order if you want them to extrapolate well. And here it shows some evidence that this might be the case. So in the, in the blue curve, uh, as see the model was trained off 512 to tokens. And we test with way more tokens, it, its perplexity doesn't go up. Whereas if we just use the T5 positional encoding, uh, the model breaks. Um, yeah, so this is some evidence that uh, uh, these it's hard to know how to teach these models to do simple addition. In, and these models are, are more pervasive in our society. We're applying them everywhere, putting them in production, maybe deciding to give credit, uh, some loans to some people, not some others. And, uh, but uh, if we want them to perform such important tasks, uh, we also probably want to make sure that they learn how to, to do additional, or at least we're confident that they can sum two numbers correctly. And so far we don't have any, any idea of how to do this without resorting to modifications in the architecture uh, of the model. But then, of course, with those modifications, it breaks uh, the usage to other tasks. Yeah, and uh, then in this third part here, it's going back to the to the more positive mood. Um, in this case, um, it's, a, it's a new application that uh, I'm quite excited. And this gives hints what we can do with these models. Uh, finally, the, we have these hammers. They are quite good hammers, and uh, I think we're just uh, 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 starting to explore what you can do with these models. And in particular, uh, this is a type of application that you can predict uh, Google Trends. So Google Trends is, uh, is this uh, web interface that aggregates user queries uh, over the time, and then you can see what are the, the most popular ones of what people search. Uh, but in this application, we're not having to rely on user queries. So and here, how it works. Um, we first started with a collection of documents, like either from archive or for pump, from PubMed. And then we feed each one of these documents into Doc2Query. 
Dr. Query will predict uh, queries or questions that these documents might be relevant for. So in other words, it's kind of uh, acting as a summarizer, uh, generating questions uh, that, that have compressed a lot of the information of the input document. And one thing then we can do is to aggregate those questions. Uh, we can use some uh, uh, paraphrase models to, to decide which one of the questions are, are similar so we can cluster them. And this will, and then we finally convert these questions into topics. So like we, we just remove these uh, with simple regex, what, what is all, all these type of patterns that are, that are present in the questions. And then we can uh, finally extract terms. And these terms, they all attach to the, to the original document, which contains a date that was published. So with that information, we can now uh, trace curves, charts like this one. Uh, we have uh, the year of publication of the document and then in the, in the, in the, the y-axis, we have the normalized uh, occurrence of that particular term. And uh, if we look for the term BERT uh, using our method, uh, which is called corpus to question, and there was uh, extracting terms from archive. We see, uh, not surprisingly, that uh, around 2020, uh, 2018, uh, birds start to grow, and then 2019, it it was well, it reached a peak. It, it reached a, a high level. Same with Google Trends. So this coincides with the Google Trend curves. Uh, and as I said, we don't need any any user queries to to predict this curve. We only use archive. Um, we can also see some more interesting patterns. Uh, if you look to the term LSTM, LSTM is, it's this popular a recurrent neural network, popular before transformers now, I guess most of the people they use transformer. And um, we see that there's a high interest uh, on archive papers about this term LSTM around until 2018, 2019, but then start to drop after that. And the archive community, the computer science community is not probably not looking into LSTMs anymore, at least not studying that anymore according to our method. But Google Trend user queries are still uh, on its peak, but uh, it seems there is some signal that it's start, starting to decline. But uh, in other words, we, we, we have this shift here in terms of uh, we have this advantage of uh, we, this possibility of predicting ahead what will be the evolution of some topics. Uh, there's also this other, just to confirm that uh, our method is, is working correctly. SIFT was a popular computer vision algorithm before conv convolutional neural networks. And uh, we see that um, uh, uh, corpse to question already predicted, uh, already saw that it's this less interest in the, in the SIFT algorithm over the time. Whereas Google Trends is still a little bit, a few years behind the prediction from, from corpus to question. So yeah. And finally, we have feature extraction. This is a more interesting one. Uh, feature extraction, um, uh, according to Corpse to Question, they lost a lot of interest from the scientific community, uh, or at least the ones that published put their papers on archive. But then on Google Trends, uh, it seems to just to, to, to increase. So there is this mismatch between uh, these, two these two terms. And uh, with this mismatch, I, I think we can uh, create those hypothesis generator models that uh, tries to overlook at uh, some uh, scientific topics and then suggest to the user what are, what are these topics that are largely ignored by some portion of the community, of the, the scientific community. Yeah, and um, some conclusions here. First part, I show some success. Uh, people, uh, Andrew, Niels, everybody uh, show already how to, uh, the, how these models, they perform well. And um, I present this spam mono duo. Uh, we are quite uh, proud of this architecture. It's, it seems to work well on many competitions, zero shot uh, way. But uh, I still think that uh, uh, we are using way too much the supervised data. If we want to improve our zero shot performance, we should be using less supervised data, rely more on some naturally occurring pattern in our, uh, in our data uh, and to try to have these models perform well on unseen uh, distributions. And another thing is that this limitation, we, we still don't know how to teach simple addition to the models. Uh, I showed that uh, they break on when it try to extrapolate on simple addition tasks. And uh, the, uh, some evidence that uh, the problem might be in the position encoding, but it still couldn't figure out a way to, to fix this problem. And I think this is important. Um, as I mentioned already, these models will be put in production. Uh, they're gonna be used by tons of people. 
want to make sure that at least they know how to sum two numbers if they want to make important decisions for us. And in the future, uh, with this this corpus to question model, there's some hint that uh, we we might be able to predict the, evolu the evolution of scientific topics. And uh, being more ambitious here, uh, it would be awesome to have like this hypothesis generator um, that suggests what will be the interesting research topics or what will be the ones that are largely ignored by the community. And I think that that should be some um, some effort to create some, this type of applications. Yeah, and with that, I conclude the talk. Thank you. All right. Shamil? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the, my mic should be uh, the volume a bit up. Um, so do we have uh, questions? I see one question at the back. Okay, thank you for the talk. About the last part, um, uh, so you just uh, apply the doc to query to the archive papers, and uh, it's quite obvious that uh, you see the shift in the predictions of your corpus to question model with the Google Trends because uh, the scientific community always can suggest has some research topics. Then it might be some popular after some time, but uh, can it be used to predict the new topics? Uh, with uh, like some model which can encode text in some way or uh, some research topics to like tell if it's relevant to the future? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. We still don't have any way to evaluate it properly. Like our baseline is only Google Trends and that's, 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 that's a pity, I think. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, of course, we can use the naturally occurring data of temporal data, like we train the model up to certain years and then evaluate in the next years and see if it predict correctly the evolution of those topics. But um, we don't have any ground true, unfortunately. And uh, these, of course, the, the task of predicting what is overlooked is an um, unknown problem. It's uh, you, you don't you don't know for certain if there are some overlooked topics. Uh, there is no benchmark for that. But but I think that's that's the 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 goal. It's um, it's not just trying to make it as a prox to Google Trends, but also to suggest what will be either something that a scientific community will catch up in the future or something that uh, they should catch up, but uh, they are ignoring at the moment. Yeah. Um, how does your tool as a automatic hypothesis uh, generator uh, relates with other works that already are automatic hypothesis generators? Uh, can you give an example? Or? Yeah, so you, you think this has potential for automatic hypothesis generators? So I wanted to know uh, your particular method. Uh, how does it compare to other method, methods that are, already exist for generating hypotheses? Yeah, yeah I, th I think there are a ton of four, especially. I cannot remember the name of the author. But uh, extracting these uh, links between papers, for example, uh, and um, uh, see if the two uh, disconnected parts of the scientific literature graph um, and, and pre predicting this connection between this, this, this parts of the graph and then suggesting this, these two should be connected. I think it's, a, it's a many decades over. And, um, but I think now, I think we have way more powerful tools to, to, to make those predictions uh, with these models. And uh, I, I think it worth uh, revisiting those methods. Previously, they were working this lexical overlap, very simple, like PM25 ish uh, uh, correlation between documents. But now that I have more powerful met, uh, models, uh, we can, for example, predict these this connections with more confidence, I think. And um, yeah, it, it, in, in other words, we could simply reuse those tools. Yeah. 